this diagram, we have the temperature of the water in degrees Celsius on the side and the energy added in kilojoules on the bottom. The graph starts by showing ice at a temperature below freezing. As we add heat, the temperature goes up until we get to zero. At zero, even though heat is being added, the temperature isn't changing. This is because the heat is going into changing the phase of the water from solid to liquid, not in increasing the kinetic energy. The amount of energy required to either melt or freeze water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. This is known as the delta H or enthalpy of fusion or molar heat of fusion when it's melting, which is endothermic. It can also be called the enthalpy of solidification if it were freezing water into ice, which is an exothermic process. But they're really truly the same thing. Once all the ice is melted, the heat will raise the temperature of the water until it hits 100 degrees Celsius. This is the boiling point or vaporization point of water. Now it will take 40.7 kilojoules per mole of energy to turn the liquid into a vapor. This is the delta H of vaporization for water and it's an endothermic process. If we were cooling the steam into water, we would call it the enthalpy of condensation, which is exothermic, but it's the same amount of energy required as vaporization. The molar heat of vaporization is a much higher number than the molar heat of fusion for water. This means it takes more energy to change from a liquid to a gas than it does to change from a solid to a liquid in the case of water. After all of the water becomes a vapor, the increased heat will continue to increase the temperature of the vapor. This is also why steam burns are worse than hot water burns. They have a much higher temperature and can do more damage. So how can you calculate all of the energy required to go from ice to steam? It's gonna take a few steps. So let's try a problem. Calculate the amount of heat necessary to vaporize 125 grams of ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius. We'll need this information, Q equals MC delta T, the specific heat of water and ice, and the enthalpy of vaporization and fusion of water. So now let's break down the process. First, we'll calculate the energy to warm up the ice to zero degrees Celsius. Since the temperature is changing as we add heat, we'll use Q equals MC delta T because it includes delta T change in temperature. We'll also need the specific heat capacity of ice, which is 2.1 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now we can plug in our data. So we'll have the mass of 125 grams, the specific heat of ice, and the final temperature of zero minus the initial temperature of negative 10. Be careful with those double negatives. This creates a positive number. So Q will equal 2,625 joules. We'll save the rounding of the sig figs until the very end. The next step in the diagram is the melting of the ice. Melting ice doesn't change the temperature at all, so we can't use MC delta T because we have no delta T. Instead, we'll use the enthalpy of fusion and some dimensional analysis. 125 grams of water times the molar mass of water times the heat of fusion gives us 41.7 kilojoules or 41,700 joules. Either one here is fine, but when we add these up in the end, we're gonna to need to be consistent between all of our units, either kilojoules or joules. Heating water involves a change in temperature, so we're going to use Q equals MC delta T and the specific heat of liquid water. We'll plug in the mass and specific heat of water the final temperature minus the initial, which in this case is 100 minus zero, and we get 52,300 joules. Now finally, we'll calculate the heat of vaporization of the water with the enthalpy of vaporization and dimensional analysis. 125 grams times the molar mass of water times the molar heat of vaporization, and we get 283 kilojoules or 283,000 joules. Finally, you're gonna add the values from every single step in the process. And our grand total is 380,000 joules or 380 kilojoules. But what does a number like that even mean? It's not really in familiar terms. So let's put it in terms of calories. There are 4.184 joules in a calorie. Is that number familiar? It should be. It's the specific heat of water, which makes it nice and easy to remember. But calories with a lowercase c aren't the calories that you see on the back of a food carton. Those are kilocalories, or calories with a capital C. So we'll use some dimensional analysis to see how many kilocalories it would take to turn the 125 grams of ice into vapor. We calculated 380,000 joules. So we'll convert the joules to calories, then the calories into kilocalories, and we get 91 kilocalories which is the calories you see on the back of a food box. This is the same as about a quarter cup of guacamole. Mm, yum. 
One last thing before I go make some guacamole. Let's calculate the heat of a reaction of chemicals. This process is really just like calorimetry. But instead of putting some object in water, you'll mix two chemicals together in the calorimeter or dissolve a chemical in water. You measure the temperature to its highest or lowest point to get the final temperature. Let's try an example with the molar heat of solution. 0.333 moles of a solid was dissolved in 260 milliliters of water at 22.3 degrees Celsius. After the solid had fully dissolved, the final temperature of the solution was 27.5 degrees Celsius. What is the molar heat of solution of the substance? We start this problem just like the unknown metal calorimetry problem. We'll calculate the Q of water first because we have all of the information for water. And because one milliliter of water is equal to one gram, we can say that there are actually 260 grams of water. The specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the final minus initial is 27.5 minus 22.3 degrees. Our total, therefore, is 5,700 joules. Now the water absorbed heat, which means the reaction gave off heat, so we'll make this a negative number for the Q of the reaction. Now we want to know the heat of dissolution in joules per mole. So what we have to do now is divide by the number of moles, and we get negative 17,000 joules per mole, or negative 17 kilojoules per mole. This chemical would make for a good hot pack because it's exothermic when the attractions between the molecules or atoms are broken. Other chemicals are endothermic and would make for good cold packs. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at SciencePet.